Hello friends, my name is JJ, and get this, in 2017, the USPS released a set of stamps commemorating America's most beloved sports balls. Stamps are cool because they are one of the ways that the government, through its official agency, the post office, officially recognizes entries in what I like to call a cultural canon, which is to say a certain set of objects or events or places or people that are understood to have some particular degree of cultural significance to a nation. The United States Post Office is a real world leader in this sort of thing, having released numerous sets of stamps that in turn serve as tidy little collections of some of the great American cultural canons, including American superheroes, American silent film stars, American ice cream based desserts, American Mexican foods, and so on. What I like about this set of stamps is that it is all about paying tribute to the balls rather than the sports, per se. American sports have already been sentimentalized up the wazoo, but the balls don't tend to get a lot of love. Which is unfortunate, because when you think about it, American sports balls are some of the most recognizable physical objects that American culture has ever produced, with highly distinctive shapes and colors and designs. So let us do a tour of the eight balls that the USPS considers the most quintessentially American, and we shall learn all about how they wound up looking the way that they do. So let's start with everybody's favorite, the football. As I discussed in my recent award-winning video on the cliches of American high school culture, American football is basically just a spin-off of British rugby that American colleges started playing in the late 19th century to figure out whose school was better. The design of the first American footballs were thus closely based on the British rugby ball, and of all the major American sports balls, this one has probably undergone the least change in its design over the years. In fact, if anything, its design is somewhat anachronistic, intended to preserve a certain authentic 19th century British rugby ball look that the Brits themselves no longer even use. So before rubber was a mainstream thing, the way people made lightweight balls was by taking a uh, pig bladder and blowing it up like a balloon. This is where the cliches about the old pig skin come from. And to keep that delicate organ skin from bursting, they would cover the bladder with the hide of a second animal, usually cow leather, and then stitch it up. All right, so I would argue that one of the most important figures in American cultural history that most people have never heard of, though they might recognize his last name, is a guy called A.G. Spaulding. Born in Illinois, Spaulding was a professional baseball player who played for both Boston and Chicago before retiring in 1877. He went on to found the first major American sporting goods company and for the rest of his life sought to make himself a key figure in all of the new, distinctly American sports that were being invented at the time, such as American football. Today, the Spaulding Corporation, which is still very much in business, takes credit for having designed the first mass market American football in 1887. As you will soon see, this is gonna become a reoccurring theme of this video. Today's footballs haven't really changed that much in terms of design since 1887. Like I said, they were just pretty much based on the design of British rugby balls anyway. As vulcanized rubber became more widely available, the pig bladders were inevitably replaced with more sanitary and strong rubber ones. And of course, these days you can buy footballs made entirely out of rubber, like this crappy number here. But the real professional grade footballs continue to have an outer covering made of real leather. If you've ever seen an actual NFL football they use in games, they're really quite beautiful, well-crafted things with the laces still tied by hand and all the rest. The biggest design innovation that we've seen since the early days are probably these stripes at the top and bottom. You can see on this stamp, the ball has a half stripe, which is the standard look for footballs used by college teams. And up here in Canada, we rock the full circle stripe. NFL footballs, meanwhile, have no stripes at all. In theory, this is done because the bright white stripes make the more amateurish players in the lesser leagues see the ball better, but they also serve an even more practical function. The different footballs used by these three different leagues are all slightly different sizes, so I guess this is one way that you can tell at a glance which ball is regulation for what. All right, so I mentioned how the late 19th century saw a big burst of new 
American sports being invented. A lot of this was bound up in Victorian era theories of character building, and there was something of an arms race among physical education teachers of the time to see who could come up with the best new sport to best improve the American man. James Naismith was a PE teacher at Springfield College in Massachusetts. In 1891, he invented an exciting new game for his students called Basketball, which was an elegant, non-violent game based around gracefully throwing a ball into a peach basket. Initially, it was played with a leather soccer ball, but the constant dribbling, which was a thing the players liked to do, despite Naismith's protestations, would see the ball quickly get all smushed and bent out of shape. So in 1894, Naismith went to old man Spalding in Chicago and asked him to design a special ball for his new sport. What Spalding came up with was basically just a spherical football, a rubber bladder encased by a shell made of stitched together slices of leather, complete with the lace on the front. But the great genius of Spalding was knowing how to create balls that would have the perfect degree of structural integrity based on the way the pieces of leather were sewn together. Spalding's basketball could keep its shape even after endless dribbling and was a huge hit. In the 1940s, they gave up on sewing and just started gluing the slices of leather onto the rubber bladder directly, which is still the way that NBA grade basketballs are made today. The black stripes are basically just an anachronism. They represent where the stitches used to be, but they've hung around because the players claim that they help them grip the ball better. Since they were both made out of leather, initially basketballs and footballs were the same color. But according to NBA.com, it was Tony Hinkle, the legendary coach of the college team at Indiana's Butler University, who convinced the Spalding Corporation to start dyeing the balls orange in the late 1950s. And like the stripes, the shade of orange increases depending on how amateurish the players are. So an NBA ball is still mostly brown, while college balls are a bit brighter. And a real cheapo ball, like this number I got at the Walmart, is an obnoxious neon shade. Also attending Springfield College at the time was a younger man called William G. Morgan, who liked Naismith and was inspired by him to create a sport of his own, but he wanted something that was even gentler than basketball, something even old people could play. So in 1896, he got old man Spalding on the blower and was like, listen Spalding, I want you to make a ball for me like the one you did for Naismith, but it has to be softer and lighter because in my sport, people are just gonna bounce it back and forth with their hands without all that running around. Less dribbling, more, you know, volleying. We'll call it like Mintonet or something. I don't know, the name's not important. Just make me a ball. And Spalding came up with this thing, made of 18 strips of super lightweight leather, the world's first volleyball. And for the first hundred years or so, the ball basically stayed the same. Volleyball was initially played mostly indoors, so white leather was originally used as a way to improve visibility and make the ball contrast against the generally dark walls of your typical Victorian gymnasium. But as the game slowly migrated to become more of an outdoor beach sport in the latter half of the 20th century, players began to complain that the ball blended in with the bright summer sky and white sand. In the 1996 Summer Olympics, the first Olympics to feature beach volleyball as a distinct sport, they used a yellow and blue ball, which was a huge hit. And ever since, blue and yellow have apparently been the standard colors of professional volleyballs, both indoor and out. This is a fact I was not previously aware of as someone not terribly plugged into the volleyball scene, but I guess it does explain the stamp. In 2008, the International Volleyball Federation drifted even further from Spalding's original vision, officially rejecting the standard 18 strip design in favor of two new looks for the two different kinds of volleyball, with the indoor one being further revised in 2019. And these are what have been used at the Olympics ever since. So this is a rare case in which the design of an American sports ball remains very much in flux. It has made the volleyball something that is a bit less iconic and thus harder to sentimentalize than some of the others, which I think makes volleyball culture seem kind of more modest and humble in a way. I don't know if that's actually accurate or not though. Do you guys know any volleyball players? Do they seem less into their own lore than other athletes? In any case, on the clear opposite end of the sentimentality spectrum, we have 
the baseball. So I think we all know that American baseball is basically a 19th century offshoot of British cricket, or possibly an old obscure game called Rounders, in the same way that American football is an offshoot of British rugby. And as a result, the first baseballs were very much like cricket balls, which is to say dark and hard and leathery, and featured a distinctive cross style stitch that was sometimes called the lemon peel design. The more lightweight balls with the more structurally sound figure eight stitching that we all know and love today came later. And according to this excellent book, The Secret History of Balls, there is considerable dispute over who precisely invented it, when and where. But all I know is that Spalding Corp claims to have invented it in 1876, and that's good enough for me. Alert viewers may notice that 1876 is actually a year before Spalding retired from professional baseball, which the Spalding Corp website openly acknowledges. In his final year playing for Chicago, the great man pitched every game with a baseball he developed himself. Now Spalding, or whoever, chose to go with white leather for the baseball, and much like the volleyball, this is not seen as a choice that has aged particularly well from a practical standpoint, because of course baseballs are also flying around high in the air where they blend in with the bright sky and sun. But because baseball is America's game, people are very defensive about baseball traditions in a way they just aren't with volleyball. So trying to change the color of the baseball is like trying to add mushrooms to apple pie. No matter how calm and logical your argument, it ain't gonna happen. Bright red stitching is about as far as anyone's been willing to compromise. Okay, so now let us talk about a couple of balls from sports that Americans didn't invent, but have still been a big hit over here anyway. Tennis is probably the oldest continuously played sport in the Western world, and it comes up in Renaissance art, Shakespeare, and the French Revolution. It has changed a lot over time, however, with the form of tennis we know today, sometimes called lawn tennis, being invented by British tennis reformers in the 1870s, with the first grand tennis tournament at Wimbledon held in 1877. Early tennis balls were made of leather, like pretty much every type of sport ball in those days, but the British reformers came up with the idea of using rubber covered with white flannel for a softer, slower play. In subsequent decades, tennis ball engineers would really get the fuzziness down to a science to maximize aerodynamics and racket control. Initially, the flannel was stitched on with a figure eight pattern, not unlike the baseball, but today it is just glued on with the little white lines and anachronism, not unlike the black lines on the basketball. Now, as I'm sure you've noticed, this ball isn't white. So what gives? Well, the new British style of tennis quickly caught on in America, with the US Open being established in 1881 and soon becoming one of the major American sporting events. But American tennis was always a bit more of the people than British tennis which then and now has a bit more of an upper class air to it. In the early 1970s, the Pennsylvania Tennis Ball Corporation, which by that point had emerged as America's leading tennis ball company, sorry, Spalding, started selling bright yellow and orange tennis balls, which they said made the ball easier to see for novice players like the football stripes or the orange basketballs. They proved popular with the American public and the people in charge of the big US tennis tournaments fell in love with them as well because brightly colored balls are easier to see on TV. The British, however, saw the neon yellow ball, which soon became the best selling color as a vulgar Americanism that was undermining the classiness of their sport. Wimbledon put up quite the fight, but in 1986, they admitted defeat and went with yellow too. Speaking of sports that the Brits are very defensive about, let us now talk about the golf ball. Like tennis, golf is an ancient European game of unclear origin that became quite beloved by Scottish aristocrats in the 16th century. It came to America in the late 1800s during the sports boom, with the oldest golf course in the US supposedly being the one at the Foxburg Country Club in Foxburg, Pennsylvania, which was founded in 1887. So if you're from Pennsylvania, you can feel pride in knowing that your state played a big role in Americanizing not one, but two major British sports. Anyway, early golf balls of this era were made of a hard rubber-like substance called gutta percha that was nevertheless soft enough that people could carve grooves into them to make the balls more aerodynamic and fly further. In 1908, our old buddy Spalding made the last major sport innovation of his life 
with his company releasing the dimpled surface golf ball with a soft gutty core covered in elastic bands and encased in a rubber coating so hard even the guillotine cannot cut it. Now while that basic design is still with us today, golf is also a little bit like volleyball in that people continue to refine the precise details of the ball, particularly what goes in the core. The other novel thing about golf is that it is the only major sport where players are expected to provide their own balls, with the PGA permitting the use of over a thousand different ball brands. This means that picking the right golf ball for you is a big part of being a sophisticated golfer. It is also a reason why selling hyper-specific and often very expensive golf balls tailored to every conceivable playing style has become this huge multi-billion dollar industry. Truly the shopper's sport, golfing. Okay, so chronologically, the newest ball in the stamp collection is this guy, which they call a kickball, but is more technically known as a utility ball. These things are basically a symbol of post-war American decadence, a mass produced produced consumer object, reflecting the abundance of cheap synthetic rubber that first started to be produced during the war, when the Axis powers cut off our supply of natural rubber. Utility balls flooded into post-war American schools, where they were used to promote creative play, and today I think we mostly associate them with the iconic American playground games like Foursquare, Dodgeball, and Bombardment. I don't know how purpley red became the most iconic color. I guess it was just the color that kids like the best. Not me though. I remember at my elementary school, we had like 30 red balls and one green one. And I always had to get the green one because you know, I just always had to be special. Love that sound. And lastly, we have the most obscure of all the balls, this thing, the uh, soaker ball. No, I am just joshing you, although I do come from the part of the world that is genetically programmed to be powerfully indifferent to soccer. But outside of this continent, soccer is of course the most popular sport in the entire world, with the modern game having originated in Victorian era Britain and then spread around the globe. Like the early rugby balls, early soccer balls were also made from pig's bladders encased in leather. They were made of a bunch of strips all stitched together and were usually a natural brown or tan in color. But a big problem was that they were never as perfectly spherical as people wanted. You may recall that old man Naismith in Springfield hated using them for basketball because of the way they couldn't keep their shape. After decades of fiddling, in 1970, there was a big breakthrough. The German Adidas Corporation was commissioned to make the game ball for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico. And they not only came up with a revolutionary spherical structural design comprised of 12 pentagon patches and 20 hexagon ones, but also the bold and striking visual of having the pentagons be black and the hexagons be white. This color combo helped the ball show up better on black and white TV and earn the ball the nickname of the Telstar, which is either a reference to a popular TV satellite of the time or simply the fact that it looked a lot like it. According to these little World Cup ball charts that the true soccer fans of the world have made, you can see that the Telstar ball didn't really have that long of a reign and was quickly displaced by this similar but distinct Adidas design, which is actually the sort of soccer ball that I remember us having at school when I was growing up. So it's interesting that this relatively short-lived design has somehow remained the most iconic soccer ball in the popular imagination, or at least the American imagination. I'd be curious if this look is the standard pop culture soccer ball look in non-American countries too, or if you guys have a different cliche. So, that's all I got to say about balls. This one was a lot of fun to research, and was yet another reminder of something that I have come to notice a lot in the course of making these type of videos, which is that very few of our cultural traditions are over 150 years old. I often feel like pretty much everything in the modern world is either the result of innovations made in the late 19th century or early post-war era. So my advice is that if you can only pick two eras of history to study, it should probably be these two. But as usual, let me know in the comments what set of cultural objects or symbols you would like to see me investigate next in my Great American Cultural Canon series. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you next week.